Hey guys, it's Jay Steven here. So I'm about to send a copy of my book, Why Does the Heathen Rage, off to one of my Patreon supporters, Johan Park, who asked for a signed copy of it. So uh, click on my uh, link below to my Patreon to get more information on that if you want to get a signed copy of this book as well. But anyway, before I send it off, I wanted to go ahead and just read a passage from it, uh, one of the early passages in the book. This one goes out to you, Johan. Hope you enjoy this, my friend. Baldwin II, king of Jerusalem, thought of his queen. Weeks ago, he'd been with her at Antioch, where they'd received news of Count Jocelyn's capture. She'd begged him not to ride north. He grabbed his shield off his saddle hook, slipping it on his forearm. The rain swelled in blinding sheets. Arrows were flying at them in occasional bursts. Through the mist, the king spotted a line of mounted archers screaming past fleet on lithe Arabians. He heard war yelps, and suddenly, loudly, galloping hooves and shouts barreled up on the left. He lifted his shield as a band of Turks swept in on them, like ghosts in the rain, pummeling them with arrows. A dart broke against the mail on the king's stallion. Then, as quickly as they had come in, the Turks broke away. The knights howled, the king held up his shield, signaling them to keep form. The Turks would harass them, try to break up their formation, so that they could be picked off one by one. Hold, the king shouted. Hold with us. He had to keep his men together. That would keep them alive. The king glanced at Robert when he felt an arrow slap against his shoulder. Ahead, another clutch of Turks careened at them. More arrows. The king's stallion roared and jerked back, hitting the horse behind it. The king regained control of the horse's head. The Turks wheeled past, and one toppled from the saddle as his Arabian slipped and crashed forward. Robert, in a fluid, efficient maneuver, broke out to lance the downed Turk, then merged swiftly back into the column. That same band of Turks swept back toward them, and veered in front of them to loose another volley of darts. The king's heart thrashed in his chest. He scanned the gray distance, searching for some sign of the main Turkic forces. If he could see them gathered somewhere, he could launch his knights at them. All he could see was rain. An arrow struck the horse under the knight beside him. The horse grunted and threw its head, but didn't bolt, staying tight with the column. The knight riding it was the king's nephew, Manasses, his face milk pale behind his helmet's nasal. They're everywhere, said Manasses. How do we fight them when they won't stand still? Just keep close, the king said. Let your armor do its work. Then, through the haze, a line of mounted Saracen lancers materialized, packed close, trotting dead on towards them. From ahead, Robert shouted, they've got lancers on us. They're overconfident, the king thought. They think we're boxed in. The king called out, should we surrender or teach them about our charge? Except for menaces, the nearest knights all shouted. Lances, said the king. The squire beside him blasted on the trumpet. Falling into a line, the knights unslung their lances and lowered them. The king threw up his arm, raising his shield. All around him, his men howled. They gave rein, and their horses leapt into a dead run, charging at the Muslims. The wind screamed over them. Ahead, the Arab lancers rushed away suddenly, trying to avoid the Franks. Lances lowered. The king and his men crashed through them. There was a blinding impact. The king's head rattled as his lance caught an Arabian mare and sliced into her shoulder. His black stallion tripped, puffing, and kept running, hooves like hammers. They galloped through another row of Saracen horsemen. The king aimed his broken lance as they tumbled the little Arab mares, launching Saracens from their saddles. The cold burned, and suddenly there were arrows raining down in a black torrent. His horse threw its head. His helmet rang with arrow hits. 
Ahead he could see Turks again sweeping in toward them. His stallion shot away, winning. He dropped his lance and fumbled for his sword, his teeth slamming together as some Turks swerved to avoid him. More Turks charged him from behind, and he couldn't see Manassas or Robert or any of the others. Turks galloped at a hard curve in front of him, and he reined his stallion to a stop, his stomach flying. The Turks wailed and rode closer. The king spun his horse. Turks were everywhere, riding all around him. He could go nowhere. He howled, his lungs like liquid in his chest, all of his skin tingling and screaming as he held up his sword. The Turks yelled louder. Stop, a voice cried in Turkic, and then in French, Lord King. The Turks, quieting, settled into an encirclement of the king, facing him and watching him. The blood pounded in his head. His numb, gloved fingers clutched his frigid sword hilt. Beneath him, the stallion panted loudly. Through the thinning clouds, the downpour slowed and a haze of light made the wet air glisten. Two Turks moved their horses. Into their midst rode an Arab in a yellow cloak. He pulled back his face scarf, and when the king saw him, his deep eyes and sleek, coffee-colored face, he knew him at once. Your Majesty, said the Arab in perfect French, I am Dar al Amzi, vizier to my lord, the Emir Balak. The king started to speak, but his throat was dry and thick. He rasped, So now you serve the Ortigids, since Damascus threw you out. Dar smiled. His lips were full like a woman's. I was Toktikin's man last we met, which was before you were king, I believe, on behalf of the glorious and merciful Balak, most favored of Allah, champion of true religion. I accept, King Baldwin, your surrender. Please dismount. The king slipped down from his wet saddle as Dar did the same. Dar took the king's sword and passed it to one of the Turks, who wrapped it in a white cloth. Dar barked some orders in Turkic, and somebody led away the king's horse. The king gazed past the Turks across the field, crowded with more Turks gathered in big companies. He saw dead horses and bodies strewn among them, Saracens and also Franks, his own men. Instantly he recognized at least four corpses, with many more too far away. His heart dropped, the wind biting through his armor. How many, he murmured to Dar, how many did you take? Dar babbled Turkic to one of his men, and the Turk nodded. We have taken a few, said Dar. A few. So most of them would be dead. The king's sword arm tingled. With five of his men, Dar walked the king to a place on the field where the emir's banner had been planted. Beneath the flagpole sat Robert, Manasses, and a few Armenians, all battered, bruised, and hunched over their knees. The king's eyes met Robert's. Robert got up, and the king embraced him. Sire, Robert whispered. Blood filled one of Robert's eyes. A slash congealed on his chin. His blonde hair was plastered, soaked across his brow, hanging in his eyes. The king pushed the hair out of his knight's face, which in that moment looked young as a boy's. You're alive, lad, said the king. Thank God. Dar stood watching them, his hands joined placidly in front of his hips. The king said to Dar, I beg your mercy, Lord Vizier, for the lives of my men. Dar said, You understand, king, I am but a slave. It is my master, the emir, who shall determine your fates. Where is he? At Karput, where you will be taken. The king knew Karput, a mountain fortress to the north, deep in Turkish territory, far away from any Christian city. All right, guys, that's just a little excerpt from the book. So, Johan, sending that out to you today. Hope you enjoy it, my friend. And to everybody listening, uh, you're going to have to find out what happens. You're going to have to pick up a copy of Why Does the Heathen Rage. There's a link below. Click on it. Pick up a copy from Amazon. I'll talk to all of you soon.